Hello, welcome to a short tutorial on verifying trigonometric identities. Hopefully by the end of this video you will have an idea of how to use trigonometric identities to verify other identities. It's helpful to briefly remember some of the basic identities that hopefully we should know already. Probably the biggest of those is the Pythagorean identities. We see those quite often. Then the negative angle identities and the co-function identities. Uh, this video assumes that you've already been introduced to those identities as I will be using them. For our first example, we will be given this verification that the secant of negative theta is equal to the secant of theta. A verification is where we show one side of an equation is equal to the other side. Thus, it is imperative that we choose a single side of the equation to work on. We do not work on both sides of the equation simultaneously. Down the road, we might use a strategy where we'll sneak a peek of what we could do to the other side, but in general, we will choose one side to work on and show how it turns into the other side. I usually go for whichever side of the equation looks more involved, nastier, dirty, more complex. In this situation, it looks to me that the left-hand side of the equation has slightly more going on than the right-hand side because of the negative theta going on. So now I think, what can I possibly do to this left-hand side? And to denote that I'm using the left-hand side, I'll write LHS, standing for left-hand side. And I will recopy the secant negative theta as that is what I'm working on. Now I do not have an identity that works on secant negative theta. I have some other negative theta identities and the negative angle identities, but nothing with secant. However, if we remember back to our reciprocal identity, that the secant is actually one over the cosine, I can do something with this. So now instead of an equal sign, so I'm not confused, and so that I show some sort of progress, a direction with my work, I'm going to use an arrow. I'm going to turn the secant of negative theta into 1 over the cosine of negative theta. Remembering back that 1 over the cosine is equal to the secant of theta. This is the reciprocal identity that I've used here. One of our very, very beginning identities when we defined what the secant was. Now referring back to my negative angle identities, I see that the cosine of negative theta is equal to the cosine of theta. So this is going to be turned into 1 over the cosine theta, which now cosine theta, 1 over cosine theta is secant theta, which is my right-hand side where I wanted to get to. So I will rewrite this as secant theta, and I'm done. I've shown how to go from the left-hand side of the equation to the right-hand side. The reverse direction is also true. So I could actually write these as biconditional statements if I wanted to. Let's take a look at another one. This one is slightly more involved. Again, the side that looks nastier, dirtier, however you want to call it, is this left-hand side. And so that's the side I'm going to begin on. So I'll again write LHS for left-hand side. And oftentimes textbooks like to ha have you work from left to right anyway. So just a little tip if you're stumped on which side to work on. And I recopy this. All right, 1 plus tangent. Oh, my stylus went nuts there. There we go. Tangent squared x. And now I look for anything, just do anything that I could possibly do with this. Well, down below I see a tangent squared, 1 plus tangent squared. And that makes me think of my Pythagorean identities. 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared. So I'm going to use that. I'm going to rewrite the denominator as secant squared. Okay, so the numerator stays the same and I turn the bottom into secant squared x. All right, very good. Now, in the effort of doing anything, I'm not sure what I want to do. Oh, wait, 
Here we go, a little bit of algebra, no trigonometry involved at all. This secant up top will turn my denominator to be degree 1. All right, cool. So now what I've got is cosine x over secant x. And again, now I'm remembering back to the relationship between secant and cosine that leaving the numerator the same, the denominator gets to be 1 over cosine x. Just getting creative here, trying a shot in the dark. Sometimes you just got to try something, anything, and see where it takes you. Remembering a little bit of algebraic manipulation that dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal, I'm going to apply that strategy here. So this becomes cosine x from the numerator times cosine x over 1, which is then cosine squared x. Cosine times cosine is cosine squared. And there we are on the right-hand side. I've shown how to go from the left to the right-hand side. You have to get a little creative. Effort is worth a lot here. And just sometimes you have to go out on a ledge and just try something, anything. Just get the ball rolling and maybe something will come to you. Let's try this again. This one has a specific strategy that is not evident until we see it happen a few times. Uh, and so it's really worth trying. It's not apparent which side is a little bit more involved. But once you see the strategy that I'm going to use, you'll want to choose the left-hand side. So I'm going to copy over the left-hand side, and I'll explain to you why I used that as soon as it's copied over. The reason for it is I see this near, and I say near because it's not exact, Pythagorean identity. If this was 1 minus sine squared x, that would be equal to cosine squared x. And there is a strategy to turn this into 1 minus sine squared x. That strategy is to multiply by the conjugate. Okay, And that's, this is what I mean by that. I'm going to keep the numerator the same. This denominator is the same, but I'm going to manipulate the denominator. I'm going to multiply by 1 minus sine x, which is the conjugate. 1 minus sine x on the top and bottom here. Now this new fraction I just put in here is actually just 1. Something divided by itself is 1. And when I multiply by 1, I'm not really changing anything. So this is a valid move. It's still an equivalent expression. But here's the awesome part. I have 1 plus sine x times 1 minus sine x. Now I could multiply this out the full old way, you know, do FOIL if you need to, or if you know your special patterns, however you need to. I'm going to just tell you right now that what that denominator turns out to be is 1 minus sine squared x. Multiply it out the long way if you don't believe me. It works, okay? And up top, I get secant x times 1 minus sine x. Now, down below, I have my Pythagorean identity. The whole reason for doing this was now this sets me up using Pythagorean identity or a variation of it. 1 minus sine squared is equal to cosine squared. So this, down below, becomes cosine squared x which is what I wanted on the right-hand side. And now up top, I'm going to distribute this secant x to each term. Use the distributive property up top. I know I'm doing two things at once here, and I probably shouldn't, but I'm um, living on the edge trying to use time efficiently. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing more than two things in one step ever, uh, as you're not showing your work probably clearly then. All right, I'm almost there. Check this out. I've already got the cosine squared down below that I want to get. I've got my secant x and secant x. The part I'm left wondering about is this tangent x. Can I turn this into tangent x? And in fact, I can if I use that property about secant and cosine again. I'm going to turn that. 
The first one stays the same. Now the secants can become 1 over cosine x times sine x over cosine squared x. So 1 over cosine was my secant. Now, remember back to our identity for tangent. Tangent is equal to the sine over cosine. So when I multiply these two together, that gives me sine over cosine, which is tangent. And I'm done. The secant x stays the same. This part right here becomes tangent x, and the bottom becomes cosine squared x. And I've gone from my left-hand side to my right-hand side. Again, the unique strategy I used here was this multiplying by the conjugate phase. And I did that because I nearly had a Pythagorean identity. I, if I ever see this near Pythagorean identity, I'm going to go ahead and complete this strategy of multiplying by the conjugate. Okay, That's what you need to do. All right. Uh, for my students, this is the homework assignment. For everybody else, good luck, have fun. I hope this is a little bit helpful.